Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I'm here in Paradise Valley, Arizona at my house. I've got Tom McReynolds of Black Mountain Outfitters. Tom, how you doing? Good. How are you doing today? Good, buddy. We just came off kind of a weird Mexico season. I know you were chasing the mule deer around pretty hot and heavy. We had uh, coos deer season. It's 24. I just finished my 24 season. I'd have to say it was probably one of the most inconsistent ruts and probably one of the worst antler growth for coos deer that I've seen down there. You just came off Mexico uh, as well, your season. Um, how did you guys do? What did, what did you see out there? I mean, we killed some really big deer, and we saw some deer that were giants that we didn't get killed. I mean, I'm kind of on the same page as you with that. I think that the horn growth in our area wasn't as good as I expected. Uh, the rut was definitely hit or miss and i kind of feel like it was just on one extreme to the other as far as when it actually happened um you know we've kind of called some audibles and in our future plans as far as hunt dates just because of that you know you've been doing mexico for some time now and it's interesting how you bounce around geographically and you know certain times where they're rutting harder northern southern you know central it, it's hard to put your finger on exactly when the best times are. So I hear you moving your dates next year. You're going to kind of spread things out a little bit. One of the things I've seen is, you know, I try and focus the coos deer hunts like, you know, from anywhere from that 10th through the 30th. But it can happen at any given time in there. Sometimes it can be early. Sometimes it can be late. And as outfitters with the elk, with your mule deer stuff in South Dakota and, and whitetails, we're always trying to plan the best time for our hunters, but sometimes our job is we just, sometimes we just have to go and hunt because you yeah. can only do so much. Yeah, and that's what I try to explain to a lot of potential clients. I'm like, look, I can't tell you how this is going to happen. I can call the rut in South Dakota. I'm, that's a very consistent cycle there. But as far as Mexico goes and the rut, I I mean, every year it seems to be different. And the same thing with, with the elk cycle now in New Mexico. It seems it's gotten a lot more, there's just a lot more um, room for, you know, sometimes we're seeing them right in November and sometimes they start at the end of August. Just crazy things you just never know. So you pretty much have to cover all your bases and you have to hunt. And what people have to realize is, like, it's free-range hunting and it's an uncontroll, you know, an uncontrollable thing. So you just got to you make your you know, you take your best option and go with it and go hunt hard. Mexico was definitely very, very hit or miss this year. And, and, um, so what we've, what we're planning on doing in the future is just covering all the bases, all the, all the potential times that they could, the rut really could turn on. We're going to make sure we cover. How much, um, you know, we had last monsoon season, and, and we can talk about the areas that you've hunt, you know, New Mexico, we're going to talk about it today with the elk regulations and antelope and all that. But when, you, when you're talking about Mexico and northern Sonora, and then you're talking about your New Mexico operation, we, in essence, we did not have rain in July and August. And then all of a sudden at the end of August and September, it came heavy and we had mm -hmm. good fall moisture. I have to think that the lack of July and lack of early August moisture from a monsoonal standpoint had a lot to do with, you know, we had pretty good antler growth for elk in Arizona, mm -hmm. but as far as rutting in Arizona, rutting in New Mexico, then you yep. take the rut for the, the coos deer and the mule deer in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I've got to think when most of our moisture comes in that July time frame and we didn't get it, it's got to screw them up. Well, yeah, because that moisture and the feed that it produces gets them, gets their bodies in good, healthy shape. And what people have to realize, an, an animal has to be physically ready to breed. Okay, and that's what I that's what I feel really drives the rut is how how good a physical shape the animals are in to really kick that rut in. I mean, they they can technically they can rut any time they want, um, or you know they, and they that they're will. ready. Yeah. yeah, that they will. So you're right. We had a super weak monsoon season. I mean, we it was probably one of the worst monsoon seasons hands down I've ever seen. We didn't get any of our our july august moisture early september the moisture we got was at the end of september in new mexico and it came what, heavy yeah it came heavy what it was that's too late to grow feed in our area over there and then the same thing back down in mexico um and the same thing that's when our horns are are still 
developing mm -hmm. is through August and September. Um, a lot of people from up north, they don't realize how late that those animals grow down there. So I definitely do. I saw on our Mexico deer, I saw the kind of the top ends and the back ends a little short, which I have to think that that had to do with, with feed. Today we're going to talk um, primarily about New Mexico, the regulations. I believe we have a deadline date of uh, March 18th uh, when everybody has to have their applications in. Mm -hmm. And Black Mountain Outfitters, how long have you been operating in New Mexico? Uh, this is, I think we're coming into our 18th year now. 18th um, this is, I've been doing this pretty much my entire adult life. So, yeah, we've been doing it for a long time and we've always been in those areas right there i mean those, those are the areas i cut my teeth on in the outfitting business and um you know we know we know those areas how to hunt them everything in and out as like the back of our hand i mean this is what we do and your talk a little bit about your operation for those that haven't heard you on the podcast you're based out of pie town new mexico yeah we you have a lot about your lodge and stuff we have a lodge in pie town that's our headquarters um, that's a pretty big facility. We hunt unit 12 and unit 13 out of that facility. Then we also have a lodge on the west side of the unit, which is near Fence Lake. Um, that's on uh, a ranch there. That's it's an all under one roof lodge. It's it's a, about a 10,000 square foot facility. So we'll keep smaller groups of clients there sometimes. Um, we have a really nice setup. I mean, we've in that unit, unit 12, we have over half a million acres of ranches all contiguous I and mean, i mean we control a vast majority of the unit which has enabled us to really manage and stay on top of the animals there how do you see well we'll talk about your success in the elk hunting last year but conditions as we know it right now going into the application season a lot of the guys that are listening to this podcast are just trying to figure out what is it like out there from from the time at the end of last season how have those elk been doing how's the moisture what does the feed look like what is your forecast going into application season trying to make a good decision on units and and what's shaking out there in new mexico well right now we're having definitely one of the best winters we've had and as long as i can remember we had a good winter last year we had a good spring we had good horn growth i would not call it great horn growth last year in our area but it was good um, I really feel like the animals were recovering from the year of 2018, which was the worst in history. Um, I think this year, I think we're poised to have an absolute incredible season. As long as we can keep getting this winter moisture, we'll get a good spring. I mean, that spring for these elk in New Mexico, that spring, I mean, that spring Karina. feed is everything for the horn growth. Um, I think it's going to be a really good year. I mean, we had a, almost a foot of snow last week, so... Uh, if we can keep getting that, it'll be a really, really good year. We were on the ranches a couple of weeks ago. I mean, you couldn't even get around. It was so muddy and mucky. There was just so much moisture in the ground. So, um, I mean, I think after two years coming off of 2018, I think 2020 is going to be the year. You talk about, you know, 18 being so bad and, and horrible antler growth, and then 19 being pretty darn good antler growth, but not maybe at maximum capacity. You know, you always hear two years in, the second year after a big drought, you know, is what I've always been taught and what I've always heard, that that's when potentially, if you can get the right spring moisture, get them started out right, that they can blow up that two years after. And so you're you're a proponent or you believe that that's the case as well. Yeah, for sure. Because there was, some of the bulls just didn't quite get as big as I thought they would have gotten last year, but I mean, 2018 was rough on them, so it definitely takes a little extra time to recover. Um, yeah, I'm. Yeah, I know it'll be good this year. It could possibly be just one of those, you know, those just off the chart years. So, with Black Mountain Outfitters over in New Mexico, operating primarily in units 12 and 13, you have um, private land uh, opportunities with ranches. You also have the opportunity to hunt public ground. Uh, people can apply for private land only tags. They can apply for public land. There's a bunch of different yeah. options there. Not only speaking to the people that might be interested in your private land stuff, but the people that are looking at 12 and 13 on the in the public draws, 
Um, you're thinking that the, you know the, the potential for 2020 to be a banner year is is excellent and encourage people definitely put in. Yeah, our public land hunting in 12 and 13, even on bad you know bad years, is really good. I mean, we have very limited tags in our units. Um, we do control access to a lot of public land because our ranches have a lot of public land that you know, landlock, or, you know, a lot of private land that landlocks public land. So basically the only people that can legally hunt that are hunters on draw tags or unit wide tags. And we have unit wide tags now in both units. So if you want a guaranteed hunt, you can actually buy a private land tag, landowner tag, or you can buy a unit wide landowner tag. There's two options there. Um, so that's a nice option because you do have a guaranteed hunt. And then we have the draw. And the draw odds are very good. I mean, you won't find better draw odds anywhere in the country for trophy tags. Um, Meaning for the quality that you could produce, you won't find better. Yeah, you won't find better. I mean, the biggest bull we killed last year was on a, on a public land tag. Um, I mean, our public land just gets very minimal hunting pressure. We know it very well. And there is a lot of it there that we control, too, because it's controlled by private land. So there's advantages to what to what we do and what we offer. Let's talk a little bit about the um, hunt structure from a standpoint of the season dates for the archery elk season. There's basically two seasons um, for the public hunter. There's a first season and a second season, correct? Yeah, there's a first season and a second season. Um, we internally divide those into three, actually three hunts. And there is a late season archery hunt in Unit 12 that's in December also. That's a, it's a smaller window of a hunt. But the September hunts are, are the 1st through the 14th and the 15th through the 24th. Those are the actual dates that you can apply for. We've talked about it before on the podcast with those two season structures. You know, you've got that first part of the season when the bulls are sometimes just kind of getting into it. Normally, the second season, on on average, just as far as activity, you can get a lot more rutting activity normally on an average second season, correct? But those first seasons are sneaky because they're a longer time for period. Plus, you can catch sometimes those bulls that might not be batch or might still be batchered up, or might be on their own and not with cows yet, and maybe be able to call in. Yeah, and. In 12 and 13, the, what people have to realize, it's not like some of these other areas in the Gila or other places that they're used to elk hunting. We can glass all of our stuff. We can we can see, we can get on high points and glass. There's a lot of glassing, a lot of spot and stock, a lot of good waterhole hunting. Those early archery hunts are when some of the biggest bulls get killed or at least when people have the opportunities to kill those big bulls. Because you can see them. Exactly. You can see them. You don't have to have them bugling to hunt them. That's a that's an advantage to hunting in a high desert um, environment. I mean, there are disadvantages, but that's one of the, the big advantages. We don't have to have red activity to hunt them. Now, guys that are coming in and haven't done a lot of archery elk hunting before, I'm like, look, hunt the middle or later hunts because you're going to get action, and that's kind of what it's all about. But guys that have done a lot of archery elk hunting before who just want to kill a bigger bull, I'm like, look, don't be afraid to hunt early. Early produces opportunities at really big bulls because those bulls are there. Even if they're not quite with the cows, they're there, they're close, and they're vulnerable. Um, once they get with those cows, I mean, it just changes the game. I mean, it makes it 20, 30 eyeballs. Yeah, like it's just, it just makes the odds, it puts the odds against you. And what typically happens is, is you typically are getting more opportunities at satellite bulls. Herd bulls get a lot harder to kill with a bow as you get later in September. Let's talk about genetics there in your area of 12 and 13. I mean historically some giant i mean like 430 420 430 440 450 bulls i mean big lots of extras crazy stuff mm -hmm. happening um it's pretty solid genetics wouldn't you agree yeah we have incredible genetics it's got they have to have the feed and the age class um we've got the age class bulls especially this year coming up you're going to see a lot of older age class bulls in the unit um but we, I think the feed was just, we had that real bad year that kind of set them back. There was there was one bull I know of for sure in the area that was killed that was over 430. I expected more bulls, you know, of that 400 plus caliber to be killed. Um, we saw a lot of bulls last year that were 360 to 380. I mean, big bulls, but, you know, that are, you know, just not quite what they should have been, I felt like. So I think this year they're going to explode. But when you've got those kind of genetics, I mean, that 
entire corridor. Um, I mean, in, in the past, I don't know many places that have, have produced that many 400 inch plus bulls. And when they, when they crack 400 there, they tend to, to be in that 420, 430. I mean, the biggest bull we've killed was a gross 440 bull, which is off the charts. Mm. Um, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it can happen there when, in the right circumstances. And then you throw back, I remember doing the podcast in 18 when we had the, you know, horrible, horrible drought. I mean, it was some of the best bulls were 350. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, was, like the best bulls in the, I mean, they just shrunk like crazy. Yeah. It I mean, didn't grow. Uh, we, we saw horn growth. I mean, it, the variance was 40 to 60 inches. I mean, that sounds, you know, some people may have a hard time believing that, but we've seen it over over this many years of doing this we've seen it i mean there can be huge swings in horn growth it's kind of very similar to like northern arizona and some of the units in northern arizona look at what they've produced last year compared to what they were producing before that they're coming on strong right now because they're high desert areas Mm -hmm. and ours is very similar to that Mm -hmm. the terrain and topography there in 12 and 13 are, are, are 12 and 13 generally about the same a lot of pj a lot of open country yeah um a lot of kind of broken type yeah country. 12 is primarily you know, you know pinion juniper and um high you know sandstone bluffs and a lot of glassable country a little bit more open you get into 13 there's more you know there are some areas with some pines and things like that but it is for the most part very similar gotcha um when you talk about your success last year in 2018 um how would you rate the success you know in the last 18 years how would you relate the actual success of bulls harvested last year you know if you if you were going to rate it compared to the 18 or Eight. compared to the 18 years of hunting, not 2018. Last year was great. I mean, you know, there was a lot of opportunities at good bulls. And there was a lot of bulls that we left that were really good bulls that either had been broken or they needed another year or two. And that's what we've really tried to focus on. In the past year, We've the, the management structure in our, our units, or at least Unit 12, has totally changed. Um, and that's what we're working on right now is just bringing our age class up. And, uh, you know, getting those older age class bulls and, and just managing what's harvested, uh, you know, a lot more strict. Last year, we actually, all of our ranches in the unit, we actually were able to get a special management ranch status with New Mexico Game and Fish. So we can actually manage better. Um, we have a lot of different options as far as earlier hunt dates. I mean, we can actually hunt the beginning of October um almost a week and a half before the general season with a rifle with a rifle and then we also have the option where where we can harvest our cows our cows a little more aggressively we can manage our cow to bull ratios a little better there's a lot of things there that we can do um that now over the next few years you'll see us be able to increase our quality and improve our genetics even more you talk about cow hunts you do a fair amount of cow hunts we do a lot of cow hunts i'm a huge advocate of managing cow to bull ratios uh, you see you look at the best units in arizona that produce the biggest bulls and and the cow to bull ratios are managed you have to have competition among your bulls to produce big bulls it only makes it better when you start getting too many cows it's a problem and we have i mean we have huge populations of elk on our ranches um and so we you know we you know we manage our cows very heavily and hard through Dece- November, December, and January. So if people are interested in um, cow elk hunts, get a hold of you or Zach. Yeah, get a hold of me or Zach, and uh, we, we have a lot of different options. We actually now have an extended cow season into January, and that ended up being the best time to hunt. So we have we offer our cow hunts in November, December, and January. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of flexible dates. They're three-day hunts, and for the most part, they run... 90 to 95 percent harvest rate um and almost a 100 percent shooting opportunity talk a little bit about your lodge there in pie town and the capacity that you have and the cooks and you know the i see a lot of the pictures on instagram and it just looks like a really neat place where guys can gather and have a good time talk a little bit about it well we have a, a big facility we have a big building that's about 3,000 square feet that's kind of where everyone hangs out there's you know we have tv and internet 
we have a buffet set up. Every, every meal is a buffet style meal. So all the hunters will come in and the guides come in and they eat together and hang out, um, watch TV. And then we've got cabins on the outside. So people have privacy they have their own cabins. We have a uh, one building that has just single rooms in it for guys that want their own room. Um, it's kind of like our hub. So everybody meets there, you know, for the most part, the guides and the clients meet in the lodge every morning and then they take off in a vehicle and they may drive 15 minutes or they may drive an hour because we have so many ranches and such it's such a vast area so they'll they'll drive out to their hunting area and then they take off on foot um, and even if they're hunting on the public land in let's say in unit 13 it's the same scenario they meet in the lodge they take off in a vehicle they may drive 15 minutes they may drive an hour just depends on where they're going and then they'll take off on foot they'll hunt all day typically if they're close to the lodge they'll come back for lunch um, if some of the things that we have that the clients really like as we have an 800 yard range, um, guys, you know, guys get there, they can sit down and make sure their guns are still dialed in something that we've seen in the past that is kind of, can be a huge issue if you're not on top of it is when you're flying with, you know, rifles, I mean, typically, I mean, over 50% of the time, the guns that, that fly, we see them, they're, they're not on for some reason. I, I can't explain that. But it's it's an issue, and it and it reduces your harvest rate, and it it costs guys the trophy of a lifetime sometimes. So we make sure everybody has the opportunity to sit down at a controlled scenario and shoot their rifles when they get to camp. We have walk-in coolers, walk-in freezers. I mean, we have it all. I mean, it is set up for hunters. As far as the meat processing and taking care of the animals, I mean, I assume you have the hanging racks and probably have guys that do a bunch of skinning, and or is that each individual guide's responsibility for that bowl or do you have someone that's totally devoted to skinning no each uh, each guide handles you know the the guides and the guides all help each other so if if a couple bulls come into camp the guides all all get together and a lot of times the clients want to be involved so everybody just does it together it's kind of a group thing and they'll they'll skin it and quarter it sometimes we debone it um last year later in the season we actually had one of our clients he he is kind of like a professional meat cutter and he came in and actually was was working for clients and processing for them and um helping them out with some things and that was that was nice um uh, because he's he was a specialist and um you know he the clients loved it i mean having someone like that there that was just fully devoted to helping them with their meat so that's really cool Talk about um, your antelope situation with, you know, you, you've you said for years the hunting on the west side or, you know, in the 12s and 13s have just some incredible bucks, but you've got all that property now out on the east side of New Mexico, and it's, I mean, I think you guys shot your biggest buck in on the east side, which, you know, you've always said there's more numbers, but now it sounds like the east side's getting almost as good as the west side. It is because we've... I mean, we have been very conservative on what we've been harvesting. I mean, we just, we, we cut the numbers in half, um, a few years ago. Um, and it's producing some great bucks. Um, both, both sides are producing great bucks. The West side wasn't as good last year, but what we've seen with, with antelope and, um, it's just, I can, I can call it every year when you have a really good spring, when you have good horn growth with elk. For some reason, our antelope just aren't as big. I would say they're two to four inches off. It's so, like in say. eighteen, when they were they were giant, they were, great. They were giant. They were, I mean, eighteen was one of the best years we saw on the west side for quality. I've talked to some guys, and they think it has to do with the quality of feed. That on a dry year, for whatever reason, the antelope may be eating something different, or they may be eating the feed closer to the ground. I'm not exactly sure, but I've heard it. Craig Steele says it like when antelope. When elk are big, antelope are smaller. When mm -hmm. elk are down, antelope yes. are giant. I, I yeah, With, hands down. There's no question that that's the way it is. I've seen it too many years, and and people kind of think I'm a little crazy when I say it. But I'm like, like even when I did my Arizona application for myself this year, I was like, do I really want an antelope tag this year because it's going to be a phenomenal horn growth year for elk in my opinion mm -hmm. i'm like i don't really know if i really care to have a tag this year i mean it's not going to be i don't think it's going to be a banner uh you know antelope horn growth year necessarily in arizona um last year on the east side of new mexico it was actually really dry over there and we had some giant bucks i mean it was 
you know, it was, it was incredible. Um, and our, our, our antelope on the west side were not, they weren't quite what they should have been. They were two to four inches off in my opinion. So, you know, we're actually still big bucks, but just oh not yeah, giant, I mean, giant. yeah. So you know, You're our, skewed. Yeah, we're yeah. we're skewed because yeah. we're carrying over a Boone and Crockett average. Yeah. Okay, which is you need to be kicked in the balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most people listen are thinking, oh, okay, they're like 50, 60 inches. You're like, no, no they didn't crack eighty. It was like seventy nine. That's just, no, that, that's not even dog. that. They, yeah. they didn't crack eighty four, eighty five. Yeah. I mean, so we're, spoiled. We're targeting bucks that are eighty four to ninety inches. I mean, that's what we're going after. And if we can't, I mean, a lot of the clients that come to the West Side, they're looking to kill an 85 to 90 inch buck. And if the bucks are seeing are 80 to 85 or 84, I mean, then that's kind of that's, that's kind of the bar the, we've set. That's you know? on the. Eh. <laughs> Whereas most anyone in the world would be like, dump that thing. I know. Now tell me, uh, New Mexico did something goofy. I don't know if it's still intact. Where you can't actually put in for the spot and they just like place you how does that work they don't do that anymore now okay. now it's um they have the draw hunts but then they the private land tags are actually it's a permission based uh, hunt um i we really actually like that system because it gave us a little more flexibility with you know archery and some other things before it was very hard to get the landowner tags and then you really didn't want to use them on an archery hunt most archery hunters didn't want to have to pay for the landowner tags so it actually hindered us from getting archery hunters out there and we have some great bow hunting opportunities for antelope i mean we killed last year one of our draw clients i mean he killed an 82 inch buck with his bow i mean um it's there's a lot of opportunities there but you had to have the tags and and in the past it's been difficult but now that they've gone to this private land you know this private land basically it's kind of like you can shoot whatever you want you right? can yeah which but some ranchers would just wipe and i'm sure it happened last year i forgot about this where they just yeah. basically could shoot at any buck you or any as many antelope as you want yeah but what's nice about our areas is we control for the most part you know all of the antelope country or most of it so we're we're managing it the same way we've always managed it we didn't change any of our numbers of clients anything like that we gave a little bit more opportunity on archery but i mean that's just something the archery hunters you know they're they're not going to go out like a rifle hunter and be that efficient um it's nice because you have the flexibility to manage how you see fit instead of kind of being at the mercy of of game and fish and surveys and things like that because sometimes the surveys aren't as efficient as they should be interesting so if someone wants to antelope hunt with you what do they need to do uh they just need to reach out to us and they can get a hold of zach um or myself and we can get them booked on a guaranteed hunt we have various dates now the other nice thing is they opened our season in august now there was pros and cons to that but the nice thing is is we have different dates we can offer in august and on top of it we're not elk hunting yet so we we can give those guys a lot of attention um typically the weather's very nice in august it's rainy and right now last year that was that was the the bad part about having august antelope hunts and it was the first time we've ever hunted in august it was hot i mean super hot dry because you didn't have those monsoons. yeah we didn't have the monsoons and yeah. And that really, we think, affected kind of the activity of the antelope, and it did make them harder to, to kill the bigger bucks because a lot of them were just laying down. Our country isn't flat flat like a pancake where you can see straight for miles and miles. We have a lot of texture even in our antelope country. So there's, there's a million places for an antelope buck to be laying that you won't be able to see him. And that's one of the reasons we do have big bucks because, I mean, there's lots of places for them to to hide there's you know there's lots of junipers a lot of our big bucks they'll they'll disappear into the junipers and that's where they grow old and get big um you know it's um it's a really unique place to hunt antelope especially if you want to kill big antelope you know i've t i've asked you about it before um i'm just curious the status of it your mule deer i mean because you have so many elk and it's you know I would say it's probably marginal mule deer country, but how are your mule deer doing as far as size of your bucks and same, better, worse? Where are we at? In unit 12, we, we allow our archery elk hunters to actually, when they book an archery elk hunt on our private land, they get a combo hunt. They, they have the option of buying a deer tag and then they pay a harvest fee for their, for their mule deer. 
this year we had a couple of our trail hunters that dropped their drop chasing elk to chase mule deer because we had a couple of absolutely incredible deer and our big mule deer are really coming back in unit 12 and with some of the predator management we're going to enact this spring i think it's going to get better and better over the next few years but i mean we saw multiple bucks this year that were over 200 we had, one, we had one buck in particular that was, we have photos of this buck, and he was at least 230 to 240. So, I mean, the top end potential there is, in my opinion, as good as you'll find anywhere in New Mexico. Um, the biggest thing is the season dates. Uh, the best time to see those kind of deer is during archery season when they're in velvet. Once they come out of the velvet at the end of September, they get real hard to find. Um once they once you know our general season is at the end of october which those deer are there they're just hard to find so that can make it difficult with a rifle we do get a couple special tags that are special management uh you know special enhancement tags is what we call them those are rut tags during december and january and that's when those big deer pop out you know what we saw just like we saw everywhere else the rut with with our new mexico deer was kind of off too just like mexico was so but typically you can bank that those deer are going to be running middle of December through middle of January. And so those special tags that we get, we only get a handful of them, but those can produce some giant deer. So if you come in September, you know, if you're chasing elk, you could possibly get a crack at a really big mule deer when they're in the velvet. Or if you get a special tag, and, you know, later in the season, that's, that's a really good time. Um, our general season hunts, sometimes we kill some decent deer. Sometimes, you know, we, we see a couple of giants, but for the most part, giant deer during the pre-rut and that time of the year when it's warm are very, very hard to find in the junipers. Yeah. Talk about your late elk bull hunts. Our late elk, our late private land hunts are, I mean, they're definitely a sleeper. To, um, a couple of years ago, we did kill a 400-inch bull right after Thanksgiving. Um, they can produce giant elk. What what people don't understand is, is our our elk in our area... The bulls that rut there, they don't stay there. They leave. After mid, late October, they start transitioning out, and new bulls start showing up. There's just kind of a rotation in that, that region, and you never know what's going to show up. And those bulls will be transitioning in from late October all the way through the beginning to middle of December. Sometimes we kill some really big bulls in November. Um, sometimes late December can produce some giant bulls. It really depends on the weather. It seems like the weather pushes them around. We don't have a migration like a lot of places. We have like a transition is what I would call it. They just move to different countries. Yeah, they just move to different country and they start feeding on different things. A lot of it depends on on the weather and the snow and what kind of, you know, if, if it's warm, it can get real stagnant where nothing's moving around and it's you're not seeing new bulls. But as soon as you get a storm come through, it's like, I mean, all of a sudden like elk show up that you've never seen before. And when you've got such a vast tract of land, I mean, there's just no way to cover it all. There's so many places that elk can move in and out, and elk are such a big animal that can cover so much ground in one day. I mean, you can have bulls move in from 30, 40, 50 miles away, and we've actually documented bulls moving that where we have them on trail camera in the summer. They, we will actually see them in other areas rutting that are 30 miles away, 20 miles away. Mm-hmm. And then they will show back up later in the year during the winter time. Um, I think a lot of people are in the mindset of the whitetail mentality mm-hmm. that they live in one area. Yep. Elk don't do that. Yep. That's why they're they're hard to manage because they move around a lot. Their legs are long. Yeah, they're they long. Ground, <laughs> yeah, man. a lot of ground. So yeah. that's um, yeah, those elk legs are long for sure. You know, and it's funny. You know, I'm cooster hunter and they're pretty focused in one area and then you hunt elk and it's like man these guys can cover a lot of country um i want to take a quick second here i want to thank the sponsors of the podcast i want to thank go hunt insider uh go to gohunt.com forward slash j scott you're going to get a 50 dollars go hunt gear shop gift card just for signing up uh best draw odds out there uh harvest statistics uh, it's a great resource go to go hunt dot com forward slash j scott i also want to thank the optics department at gohunt.com um, my friend cody nelson of 20 plus years is the optics manager if you have any optics needs at all if you're looking to purchase binos spotting scopes rifle scopes 
uh, tripods, anything to do with glassing, give Cody a call, 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. Uh, you can also text him or call him on his cell phone. That's 602-399-3699. Appreciate all the work that Cody does and the sponsorship from Go Hunt. Uh, also, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Kuyu is the gear that I wear on all my hunts. You can go to kuyu.com. That's K-U-I-U.com. Uh, to find out more information and order the gear right there online. It's a direct-to-consumer con- company. Um, that means they cut the price point out of the middleman and can offer a better product to you at a better price. I uh, also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott20 uh, promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount. Uh, and then OnXMaps.com. Uh, OnXMaps.com. Uh, use the J Scott 20 promo code. You're going to get a 20% discount there on Onyx. I use Onyx virtually every day that I'm hunting and fishing and even use it in my real estate business. It's got great private public land overlay. It's got aerial. It's got topo. Uh, I use it down in Mexico. Now the aerial is the only thing that works uh, that they don't have topo maps there uh, in Mexico, but I use it on all my ranches. So onyxmaps.com. Use the J Scott 20 promo code and uh, it's going to save you 20%. Uh, thanks to the sponsors. Uh, Tom, you know, we've been talking about New Mexico and you, 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 in your outfitting business, you have, you know, Black Mountain Outfitters Mexico, you've got Black Mountain Outfitters New Mexico, and a shining star that you also have is Black Mountain Outfitters South Dakota. Yeah, we've actually been outfitting in South Dakota for many, many years. And um, I guess we've been a little spoiled there because it's probably some of the best overall deer hunting hands down in the country. I mean, it's high deer numbers, very good quality, um, big mule deer, big whitetails. I mean, the biggest sleeper is a South Dakota whitetail hunt. I mean we legitimately have deer there that, I mean, we saw multiple whitetails this year that were 180, 180 to 200 inch whitetails. Okay. And we have deer like that. Most people, you know, they don't think of South Dakota for big whitetails. They don't think of it for, for big mule deer. I mean, we're carrying an average in the one eighties for mule deer and we're running with rifle hunters. We're running a hundred percent harvest rate. Archery hunters. I mean, they're hundred percent shooting opportunity for the most part. I mean, they're hunting deer. When you can go out and see multiple deer that are 160 to 180 in a day and maybe be on a buck that's, you know, 180 to 200, um, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, especially when you're seeing a lot of deer and you're on action all day long. I mean, it's just, it's such a, such a, just a gem. I mean, and so recently in the past year, we really have started increasing our operations in south dakota and leasing more land and um you know these ranches are are very well managed they always have been um so we've just been utilizing our current landowners and and meeting their neighbors and getting more contiguous properties um the the downfall is is that for rifle tags you do have to draw the tags but it's an easy draw you can draw these tags um you can draw them the first year but typically it takes maybe you know two years to get the tag on average um, it's something that is is an easy draw, but you do have to be patient with that. Archery is is still over the counter where you for private land you can still get an archery tag and you can do a guaranteed hunt. So we've started focusing a lot of what we're doing more into the bow hunting scene because it's it's not difficult bow hunting, especially even for novice bow hunters. It's a great opportunity. It's a great place to cut your teeth on spot and stock. Because the opportunity is there. And even if you come on a mule deer hunt and you're looking to spot and stock mule deer, a lot of times you'll see a big white tail laying up in a in a draw or a, a drainage and you decide you wanna you wanna put a you know, you wanna put a stock on them. And their white tails are difficult to kill with a bow and spot and stock, but we do have areas that are, are more of your typical white tail habitat where it's thick timber. down in the bottoms and timber. So we can set up blinds and stands and we do various things. Um but I mean, South Dakota, I, I can't say enough good things about it. Um, it's typically year after year is just produces some great deer. Um, the only thing in South Dakota you do have to watch out for is when they get really, really harsh winters. And we've seen in roughly 12 to 15 years, we've seen one bad winter that did, you know, it killed all of our mature bucks. 
that is one thing you have to watch out for and we do occasionally get EHD there um, things like that but um, for the most part South Dakota is one of the best places and most enjoyable places to go deer hunting now can you have a mule deer tag and a whitetail tag you know two different tags or can you is it all one uh, they have a couple different types of tags there you can have a bow tag and a gun tag um the special buck tags are actually either any deer okay. so you can shoot a whitetail or a mule deer the archery tags are there in any deer also so you can you can hunt either um and that's what's so unique about it is is the ability to you know change up what you're hunting i mean you're hunting big mule deer and all of a sudden you see a 200 inch whitetail or a you know, I mean, you can, you can call an audible and we I do change have, on that real. Yeah, quick. we do. And we have a lot of hunters that do, I mean, they, they, they are out there for one thing and all of a sudden that changes real quick. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of, as far as flexibility on the tags, most of them are any deer tags, you know, the archery are, uh, some of the, the special buck rifle tags are, they have a couple different types of rifle tags. There are some rifle tags that are county specific tags that are species specific. So you, so when we kind of walk through, you know, people through that when we do the draws, because they have a couple different draws, they have landowners. When is it? Uh, the first drawing is in April. That's for the landowner sponsored draw. They have, they have kind of like we do in New Mexico with the outfitters. They actually have a landowner sponsored draw. Um, that's called the West River Special Buck. So we that that drawing is in April. That's the best time to get a rifle tag. Then they also have a drawing in the summer, like late summer, that's for the general county tags. Okay. Um, and that operation, so you've been expanding that operation. Yeah, we expanded quite a bit last year. And the season, you're hunting in November quite a bit? Yeah, the rut starts beginning of November. So we... We typically start our archery hunts right at the beginning of November when the deer are just starting to rut. The, the whitetails, typically the rule of thumb is they'll, they'll start right around Halloween. Whitetails really get going and the mule deer are usually a few days behind. Uh, we'll start bow hunting right about Halloween and we bow hunt all the way through until our rifle season starts. Um, our rifle season typically starts the second Saturday of the month. Um, and then it runs through things the weekend after Thanksgiving. Next year, we're considering doing an after an after Thanksgiving archery hunt because our archery season actually opens beginning of October or late September and runs all the way through the end of December. Um, and bow hunting there is, I mean, in the post rut is actually really good. It's these animals. They go back on feed, don't they? They well, yeah they 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 start feeding real heavy to get you know to get themselves to get themselves back in shape but they're the bucks will go off by themselves but you in south dakota the advantage is once again that you can glass them you can see them you can get up in high points and look down in drainages and find them and then when those bucks are by themselves they're actually very easy to spot and stock so we're considering next year running a a post run archery hunt interesting Interesting. Um, I want to double back and make sure if there's anything that we didn't cover in New Mexico that you feel like we we didn't or any, anything else that you, you know, feel like we missed. I mean, the thing about New Mexico is especially, I mean, obviously we have guaranteed tags, but we have some incredible draw odds on rifle hunts. And, you know, some late season stuff that produces some great elk. I mean, for the guys out there that that don't want to spend the money on a landowner tag or, you know, it's it's out of their budget. I mean, the best thing going right now is the outfitter draw in New Mexico. Um, it's a huge opportunity. I mean, it, it's been designed the way it is for a reason. Talk about the percentages and how that works. I mean, we... I can give you specific breakdowns for each actual hunt code. I mean, very true odds of, of what your odds are going to be. But in New Mexico, is you the, th the thing is you get three choices, okay? And the, you actually, all three choices are considered, and that's a huge advantage. So what we will strategically do is put you in, you know, obviously for maybe your first choice of a very, very difficult to draw hunt that's a super highly coveted date, but then on your second and third choices, we'll start getting you in for stuff that isn't as high of demand. Well, those hunts are very good hunts. Don't think that because you draw a third choice, it's not going to be a good hunt. Those can be some of the best hunts. So, Well, especially with the mindset you're going in with Arizona where they only look at your first two. 
now they're looking at three and you're like, well, I drew my third choice. You could draw a great tag on your third sh- third choice. Yeah, you could draw a phenomenal tag on your third choice. It gives you a lot of lot of room for, you know, and you can you can mix uh, weapon types. So you could do like a rifle hunt for your first choice. You could do a muzzleloader hunt for your second choice and you could do an archery hunt for your third or or a, you know, anything for your third choice. It, you can mix and match them. That's a huge advantage. And what we do is we we have the odds in front of us and we can strategically walk you through that. You know, when we, when you just, if you decide you want to sign up with us through our, you know, application service, because this is what we do, and we'll consult you through those choices and give you the best odds of getting a tag. And the reason we sit down and talk with you is because we want to know your goals. Once we know your goals, if it's, if it's, hey, it's mainly trophy quality, it's mainly, hey, I want a tag, um, then we can sit there and say, okay, there, here's your, here's what we're going to do. Here's the three choices we're going to put together for you and why we're going to do it. And then here's the dates, and we always got to make sure because we have a lot of different dates for these hunts. So we've got to sit down and talk about that and make sure people's schedules work. Um, and we've got some later season hunts that have incredible draw odds, um, and we can walk people through that and let them know what those are, give them the pros and cons to those hunts. Um, overall, I mean, when we apply during you know during the New Mexico Outfitter draw, overall we'll draw one out of five to one out of six of our applicants, just overall. And that, you know, that, that ranges from people that are just looking for the most premium dates to guys that are, hey, I just want a tag. So that's the overall odds is when a guy asks me, hey, what's, what's my odds of getting a tag in New Mexico? And I'm like, look, if you let us, you know, help you with this and really give you our, our advice and you take it as far as what your three choices should be, I can draw one out of, you know, one out of five guys roughly. Mm-hmm. And New Mexico doesn't have a bonus point structure. So, I mean, every year you're going back in with basically everyone's got the same chance. It, it is. And it's, you know, there is there is a disadvantage to that. But for the most part, it's a great system because I've watched guys that have applied with us for years. And typically I never see them go more than four or five years without getting a tag. And sometimes guys draw tags back to back. So um, it's, a, it's a good system the way they're doing it. And, you know, hopefully it stays that way. Sounds good. Well, it's always great having you on the podcast. Um, it's fun watching the success of the businesses, or you know, of the business with the different segments of the business. Um, you know, one thing we didn't cover, I just want to ask you real fast about the Oryx and the Ibex and some of that. Do you do any of that from we, Black we, Mountain Outfitters? Yeah, we do a little bit of that if, if, you know, we have a couple of guides that actually live in those areas, and they know those areas better than anyone um and so we do as part of our application service we will apply you for those hunts and 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 we you'll have one of the most coolest experiences of your life if you can draw one of those tags those those hunts especially ibex um those are incredible hunts i mean they're (laughs) they're they're something everyone needs to experience at least once so we can we can help you out on on any of the the other species bighorn sheep ibex oryx um, we have guides that specialize in those areas, know those those animals and those units very, very well. So if you're going to get signed up for application service, it's something that, you know, if you have the money to front those, those license fees, because New Mexico is a, a state that requires you to front your license fees up front, and you do get them back if you don't draw. But if you have the money to do that, then it's a no, it's a no-brainer to go ahead and apply for those species. Awesome, man. Well... Great having you on the podcast. Wish you the best of success. And um, I know you're headed to the different ranches and and, uh, going in every direction here over the next couple months, just getting everything ready for the season. So it's always great having you on and and, um, wish you the best. For sure. And if, um, you know, people want to talk to us about our application service or have questions about guaranteed tags, um, you, you can get a hold of us. You can call Zach at our office. Um, you can see us on Instagram, which our Instagram handle is at Black Mountain Outfitters underscore Inc. And that's where we're constantly putting up, you know, new, new photos. And, and that's where our most updated information is at. But if you get a hold of us at the office, we can actually put you on our email and our text list, which is huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get on that list, you're getting updates periodically about draws, cancellation hunts, um, you know, in an operation of, of our size and what we have, it's inevitable that we're going to have people that cancel. It just, right. it happens. Um, you can get on our list, you know, our text list and our email list for cancellations, and you can pick up some of these landowner tag hunts for, 
for 60 70 percent of what they normally cost i mean depending on how it all works mu yeah much of a last minute cancellation it is so that's something that we encourage people to get a hold of us or at least contact us through our website um, so that they're into those you know in on those text lists on those email lists so that they're getting that information um, when stuff like that comes available. And I mean, is it blackmountainoutfitters.com? It's bmohunts.com. BMO www.bmohunts.com. And then, like I said, our Instagram, we, we always, you know, we post things on our Instagram, cancellations, things like that will come on our on our social media. So definitely follow our social media. Um, and then we have our office line, um, which is 602-478-478. 0601 and you would ask for zach there and then also you can be transferred to me so awesome god bless buddy thank you very much appreciate right. you having me on All again right. sounds good